I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome to uh, Unashamed. We uh, we got a treat um, in today's uh, podcast because uh, we're going to get to hear from uh, Dad from your Unashamed Bible class or, or Unashamed Bible study, I think is what we call it, that you do every Sunday um, that we invite people to come to. And they do from literally all over the world. We've had people come and, and visit uh some is obviously to meet us and kind of figure out what we're up to, but also to hear what uh, what Dad has to say. But before we do that, uh, I thought we'd talk a little bit about um, kind of our approach, uh, which is all a little bit different. Everybody has kind of a unique style whenever you're sharing Jesus, because we get a lot of questions from listeners. You know, how do I share with my friends? How do I be more bold? How do I be unashamed? Um you know, I want to be like you guys, you know, that, those type of questions. And so I thought we'd talk a little bit about that before we hear from dad's uh, class. But Zach, w- kind of what's your approach on, you know, I, and I realize every opportunity is different, but kind of what's your general approach about sharing Jesus with people? Hmm. That's a good, uh, very good question. A lot of it I learned, honestly, from you guys. Um, I try to. I try to present Jesus um, in what Schaefer references as space and time, uh, meaning that I think it's you, you can talk about it as of this as this lofty idea, but I think when you locate Jesus, I've heard Phil do this a ton. You locate Jesus in history at a particular place in time. I think it, it gives it more weight. Um, Phil, I don't know if you remember you you were being interviewed by somebody. I think it was. Uh, the Today Show, and they asked you about your your story, and you and you said essentially gave me your testimony, and you said you were living for the devil until you ran smack dab into the man from Galilee two thousand who died on a cross two thousand years ago, and the way you said it was like it just was so powerful because it was you were actually putting Jesus in a in a space and time. So um, that's one thing I, I do, and I think the other thing is is really trying to show the beauty of who God is. Um, and that God offers us abundant life and to kind of borrow from like a John Piper who would say that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So speaking more towards how, how Christ, he doesn't just solve your grave problem and your sin problem. He also offers abundant life. It, it, when you live in him, you get peace of mind. You get all the desires of your heart. Like he reshapes you and conforms you. So that that's kind of my go-to is just hitting on the benefits of being in the kingdom with the King. Oh, that's good. I like that. Um, I tend to be, I'm kind of a revelation 12, 11 guy. And again, everybody kind of has their, <clears throat> their own approach. Uh, but mine tends to be obviously focusing on Jesus and what he has to offer. Kind of like what Zach said, but then I like the idea of, of going personal with people. And, uh, it's just my nature. And, you know, I guess it came out of my own story, but you know, when, when revelation 12, 11, we said, you overcome the evil one by the blood of the lamb, the word of your testimony, and you don't shrink back from anything, uh, even death is kind of my approach, uh, to talking to people. And so by nature, people can tend to talk to me or to me and Lisa about issues they're having or problems. And so we get to the gospel because it is the core start of any life change that you're going to have. And so in that, usually my own story about what Christ did for me and how I was in a place where I wasn't trusting him, wasn't looking to him, and then out of desperation found him. And so you know, a lot of times we tend to deal with desperate people, and that's that's good. I mean, that's kind of our role, and that's where we need to be. I'm not really trying to convince them. They're, most of the time they're there if they get to me or they get to Lisa and I. And so I tend to do it that way. I mean, it's, it's personal, it's, it's lifestyle. It's of course, you know, we kind of go through the scriptural uh, references of who Jesus is, but I tend to lean toward the personal just because, you know, that's kind of my style and the way God leads me. So that's kind of my approach. Well, uh, you know, it's kind of a complicated question. I think when you, you know, when I first surrendered to Jesus, you know, I made a list after about 
you know, a couple of years of survival. Cause I mean, I was, I was only 14 and I thought, you know, part of the growing process, I thought it was like not doing wrong. I mean, I've shared this many times and, uh, it was only through kind of moving on from the gospels that I realized things like God is making his appeal through us, you know, the second Corinthians five we're therefore Christ's ambassadors. And, you know, first Peter three, always be prepared to give an answer, you know, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's, so I realized, you know, God has called me not only to save me, but to use me. And I'm not going to be able to do that quietly. So what I did was I made a list of everybody, you know, basically my acquaintances and friends. I mean, this was kind of silly to say, but who I would like to see in heaven. And I just started going down that list, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not real sure I ever got to the end of it because what happened was I started sharing Jesus with these people, and it just led to somebody's cousin and somebody it, it just it, the list grew the list grew and it never really stopped for years un until you know my life changed in a way where i started seeing opportunities to do this and have bigger audiences you know doing speeches doing events uh, even using the TV shows. As, so, so I'm looking at like in those kind of things, you're planting a seed based on your life. You're not sharing the actual gospel message, but it's a, it, it's something that lures people that seems different, that it's not, you know. So I, I think that's why I said it's hard to explain. And in a personal way, just the actual sharing the message, because that's still going on too. I'm a little bit combined on y'all. I'm going to focus on Jesus. I think we're all agree. You know, Jesus is the way that changes people's lives. So it, I view it as an introduction to Jesus, but I'm having a conversation with them because especially in America, um, people have a lot of religion and, and it's almost a negative thing. They've, They've got just enough religion in their mind to kind of justify a very contradictory lifestyle. You know, they're, so I, I have the conversation and then, you know, I'm, I, I mainly stick to John and who Jesus is and what he has to offer and why Jesus and questions like that. But I also have an umbrella, uh, the three questions of life that I got from Acts 17 that, you know, how'd you get here? Because some people don't have as much religion, and they're wondering, well, I don't even believe there's a God. And uh, not that there's any power in explaining that, but it is when you read Acts 17 where Paul was explaining the unknown God, I think that's a good reference to ask these three questions when you're now, 2,000 years later, explaining the unknown God to a person. That who believes God is unknowable, which will eventually lead you back to John, in my case, saying that Jesus became flesh to make God known. You know, that's John 1.17. So yeah. the three questions, you know, how'd you get here? What is your purpose on the earth? And how are you leaving? And so those three questions I think are a better way than where when I had my list in high school, I kind of went by the old bad news, good news approach. You know, here, here's the bad news. You're a sinner. You're going to die physically. You know, Jesus came and he took care of those two problems. You know, what are you waiting for? Put your faith and trust in Jesus and let's move. But now it's more conversational because I realize people bring a lot of baggage. So, I'm creatively trying to, one, answer what they already have put their belief system in, but two, use that to get to Jesus. I mean, I would say that's my approach. No, that's good. And you and you bring up an interesting thought that over the course of your life, your your spiritual walk on the earth, 
if you're if you're growing in Christ and He's working on you, then your your methodology may change and may mature and may be different over time. I think all of us could say that as you get to be an older man. You know, we had a, a you know recently we had Father's Day, and you know it's interesting because I, when I get texts on Father's Day, I get them from my kids, which you would expect, and now my older grandkids because they have phones, but. What you wouldn't expect was I probably got at least half a dozen texts from men around the country that I've had a direct uh, opportunity to mentor and some to lead to Christ years ago. And so I just thought about that. Why would they feel compelled to send me a note on Father's Day? It's because something instilled in their lives through a process meant enough to them, but yeah. they would reach out. And so I yeah. think as you, over time, that's the kind of things you want to do. You, you want to have present. Yeah. I think, I think well, when I, think, I was early on, I focused on the response to Jesus too much. What I realized is if you focus on introducing Jesus to a person, even if you have to wade through, we all have baggage and we have things that confuse yeah. us and, if you focus on Jesus and they fall in love with Jesus, well, there's a response is a lot easier to explain once they respond. Once they say, I want to follow Jesus, what do I do? You know, and I'm basing that on Acts 2. You know, he got up there and introduced Jesus, Peter, in a powerful way. Once they said, what, you know, what do we do? I mean, well, that that's where you want to be. Yeah, but they asked. Yeah, uh, they they asked the question. What shall we do? I, I, yeah, I, I think that if it, your your questions that you mentioned earlier, you know these these are fundamental questions that, and this is I, I should have said this too. We all have these, and I think at some time in a divisive culture like that we live in, we assume that other people who may not come from the same worldview or area or life that we come from. Uh, that maybe they don't have those same questions, but I've just found those questions that you mentioned are universal questions that everybody wrestles with. Where did I come from? You know, what happens after I die? Like these are, these are questions that everybody on some level has contemplated in their life. You're, you're trying to make sense of your experience here and everybody's doing that. Everybody. That's why you notice even the people that are hostile to the, to Jesus. If you look at, the way they live, they, everyone lives religiously in a way. I mean, the, uh, things that are counter to the gospel, they still have a religious nature about them. Mm -hmm. It's because we all are asking these fundamental questions. And, you know, I think that when we present the gospel of Christ to someone, um, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of like you, Al. I mean, I don't necessarily go out there and I'm not banging down the streets, knocking down doors. I, I feel like people are coming. Yeah. I pray for God to send us seekers and then we 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 get into long discussions and walk with people, um, but it's it's answering those fundamental questions about our our experience here as humans. Only in Christ, only in Christ, can those answers be truly or those questions be truly answered. So I try to lean into that too, Jason. Those are what are the you have three questions, yeah, right? How did how did you again? get here? So if you read Acts seventeen, it, it kind of comes out when it says the God who made the world and everything in it uh, doesn't live in temples built by hands. You know, he's not served by human hands because he himself gives all men life, breath, and everything else. You know, how did you get here? I believe you know God. God made us. Uh, what are you doing here? And it says, you know, he did this, so this is 27, so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. There, There's a there's a natural or spiritual slash spiritual draw to people to uncover their existence and how they got here, to find God, to have a relationship. And then the third one, how are we leaving? And he gets to the end where he says, you know, he's given proof of that there's a day of judgment by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And if if you're interested in living forever, whoever this Jesus is, because most of the time people have not approached him in a personal way, he has the power for you to leave the earth and never die again. I mean, that's kind of the three questions. Hear what they think. 
get it to Jesus, what he did. You know, the cross is in there for forgiveness and grace because that comes out of that. Well, I, I don't, I can't find my purpose because I keep screwing up, you know, so. So we all shared that on uh, on kind of our approach. And the good news is we get to hear exactly uh, what your approach is because we're about to listen to um, how you share every week or really a lot, even not just once a week, but when you get the opportunity. Uh, but your unashamed Bible class that we do every week at WFR at nine o'clock, um, we get to hear one of those. So uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back on the other side of this break. We will hear Phil's approach uh, to how he shares with folks in real time. So uh, let's take a break. So one of our newer sponsors that we love is a company called Barrel Buddy. And Jay's there a lot like us. They had an idea. They they discovered yeah. it in the field. Well, one of the things we did when we were trying to sell our duck calls is we would put our duck calls in tubs of water at these shows. And we would show them that through this process of a double reeded system, it would help get debris out of the duck call it would function and we would pick them up and blow them straight out of the water and uh it made me think of these guys because you know they've come up with an idea on a way to clean your gun no that's really good and and, and kind of like that it's a it's a discovery product because they were like us they were hunting they were out in the muddy field up in michigan and they said man this we, we got to find a better way to clean gun because you had the old days you had the patches uh, and after, and I remember those, then you had the boar snake was kind of the long thing you would try to take through there. But once it turned black, you didn't really know if your gun was clean or not. And so with this new 3d polymer that they're using, it's white, it shows you what comes out of the gun. Everything's cleaner. Everything's better. Uh, great product, great company, uh, great Christian value. So we love these guys. Check them out. Barrelbuddy.com. B-A-R-R-E-L buddy.com. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all start out, Jesus, how he got here, healed the sick, chased demons out of people, going around doing good. That's Jesus. So you got Matthew 16. Everything begins to change. Matthew, you say, what? Matthew 16, things begin to change. But you say, why? All this has to be accomplished. He came to save the world. He said, from that time on, this is Matthew 16, you ought to look at it. Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the most religious people on earth, for crying out loud. Elders, chief priests, I mean, we're talking about religious and teachers of the law. Jesus is talking, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, chief priests and teachers of the law, that he must be killed. This is how he died. And on the third day, be raised to life. That's good news. Amen. That's why this is called the gospel. Now, the fellow who converted me, I was 28. He had been there a while. I owned a beer joint when I ran up on him. You ever owned a beer joint? He showed me this. He wrote this down on a piece of paper, handed it to me. I said, hmm. He told me later, it's the first time he'd ever just actually written out God becoming flesh, Jesus dying on a cross for the sins of the world, being put in a tomb, and three days later being resurrected from that tomb. That solves your sin problem. He took them all, took them all away, gone. Not going to hold any more thing in the past against you. Not one. You're like, take all my sins away. Yep. You said, 
What about when I, when I sin again though? Not counted against you. Not counted against you. You say, you mean everything in the past, the sins are removed and everything in the future, none of them, we're not under law. Every little, the law's great, unfortunately. No one has ever kept it, but the one who wrote it. You're like, he gave us a lot better thing. Grace is way better than law. Oh, what are you talking about? So, there's one final arrow there. John chapter 1 to cover this. The departure. Acts covers it good. Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do. I've showed y'all this this morning. And uh, to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions. That air coming out of that tomb 40 days later, he just went back to where he came from. He came from a long way out there. I guess. I'm going with him. Yeah. You're like, that's Acts chapter 1. You're like, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men. Many convincing proofs he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about what our lesson's going to be about. The kingdom of God. You say, so exactly what are we doing here? This is not like regular services, you notice. It's people, and it's y'all, that have shown up, and you ain't from around here for the most part. The few you see sitting here, they're privy to this all the time. You say, how far do you go beyond that? Not far. God becoming flesh, dying on a cross for us, being buried in a tomb, being resurrected from the dead, guaranteeing ours, went back into heaven. Looks like to me, <laughs> we're the, looks like to me, that's already happened. That's, we're counting time back. We're all saying, all right, it's 2,300, what is it, 2,223? You say, yeah, that's how many years since this happened. The atheists are counting time <laughs> by Jesus Christ and claiming he's never been here. Never been here? I mean, yeah, I don't believe he was here. I'm like, well, you're counting time by when he showed up. That ought to prove to you he was here or you wouldn't be counting time by him. I don't think. You say, well, what do you call it all the years before he showed up? They're called all the years before he showed up. <laughs> B, C. So, what does that stand for? That's before Christ. So I don't know what these days they're running them somewhere over there with a big explosion and here we all are. I'm like, have you ever checked out uh, the one that did this? Everything was, he made it, the whole thing. He made the cosmos. He made you and me. Formed us in our mother's rooms. Think about that, really. Talk about, there's a lot going on to get us on the earth. Right? Right. I mean, you women know, I just watched one of mine being born and I salute all women worldwide after watching that. I'm like, good night of living. Here comes old Jeff. The rest of them, I didn't see them being born. She said, you need to watch the birth of a child and you'd loosen up. I said, you have spoken a lot, Miss Kay. She had a kind of like a rising on her leg. And so she'd been going to the wound care but I took over yesterday and said, let me, you know, so antibiotics here on the leg, I'm fixing on my woman's leg. I've been with her about 60, 60 years. Good woman.
So, Zach, uh, you've done a lot of ministry. When you were here uh, in Monroe, West Monroe, you did a lot of uh, college-age ministry, worked yeah. a lot with young men, young women. Uh, would it be safe to say that uh, the scourge of pornography is a huge problem? Oh, gosh. I would I would take it further and say it's, it is the dominant issue that young people face. I think it is... Yeah, it's corrupting a culture, a whole generation of people. And, you know, I mean, you, you work some with the results of what happens after you see years mm-hmm. of being exposed to it. You have boys you, you're trying to raise. All of us understand that this gives us such a warped view of this beautiful gift that God gave us, right? Because it's all fake. It's not real. Yeah. Uh, and yet to the young mind, it feels real. Um, the polls say 56%, so more than half of all divorces, list pornography as a major factor. So it's not just going to get you in the moment that it's happening, but this has long-term effects that are super negative. So what we want to to really press on our podcast is accountability. And one of the best people, group of people we know to help with that is our friends at Covenant Eyes. Mm -hmm. For over 23 years, uh, they've been helping people um, have accountability and and get away from pornography, which is a great blessing. So right now they're uh, offering, if you go to their website, which is CovenantEyes.com, and enter the promo code Phil. you can get 30 days free of Covenant Eyes. And this is something you need to check out. It's great for your family, obviously a protection for your children as well. Check them out, free 30 days, CovenantEyes.com. Use the uh, promo code Phil. Now, watch this. Let's start in Daniel. And I want to show you something. I think probably what we'll do first, let's go with uh, Matthew 1 and 2. Let's see how we could do this to make it. Well, here's one I can give you. Uh, Luke 3.23 Luke 20, Luke 20, Luke 3, 23. Now watch this. And then have your hand on the book of Daniel. One thing to show you. Here's what it says. Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And he gives his, all of his earthly kinfolks. He did all his, he, did, he, he was 30 years old when he began his ministry. In the book of Matthew, let me just show you. I wrote it down. Matthew 1 and 2. Now watch this, how this works. Let's start with Matthew, John the Baptist. Just prior to Jesus, nine months, ten months or so, a raggedy looking character came walking up out of the wilderness the desert wilderness, and they, and he was a bone to be chewed. You say, how in the world, why would God take a raggedy looking guy like this? You'd have to check with him about it. He wasn't all slicked up when he showed up, I can tell you that, John the Baptist. He came preaching in the desert of Judea saying, now just listen to this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is near. And, and most people are, are saying, what in the world is he talking about? A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. The Bible says, Matthew recorded, waiting on Jesus, John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. What I'm trying to y'all is get to see. 
the heavy, rich people, fancy people, well-known people. His clothes were made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. This is one raggedy looking dude. So don't be bad about my whiskers. I hadn't shaved in a few years. You say, you're gonna start shaving and get all slicked up? No. Why? I'm just gonna roll. People went out from Jerusalem and all Judea, John the Baptist, and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. This has not happened yet. We're in this stage. And this ragged character shows up pointing the way for this one. This is Jesus. John the Baptist saying, listen to him, confessing their sins. We're coming up on this. This hasn't happened yet. The blood has not been shed. That's coming. And look, now, now, when you hear somebody say something, if something, and he says, this is near. Repent, the raggedy look of them, paving the way for Jesus, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So if you hear somebody tell you, look, I want to tell you something. This is what's fixing to happen. It's near. Well, near is the opposite of far. This is way, way away. Oh, way away. Yeah, this is way in the future. Oh, I got you. I, I didn't know. I didn't know that. So this is what? This is, this is at hand. The time is near. Would you be thinking, looking thousands of years way ahead? What would you come if somebody said, I've got something to tell you, and this is going to happen. It's very near. It's near. It's fixing to happen. What, do you, what, what would you look for? What, what time frame? Would you be looking at 100 years? I wouldn't. Soon. Not at all. I'd be saying, this is fixing to happen, happen pretty quick. Matthew 4, 17. That's another one. Where are my specs? 4, 17. From that time on, that, with Jesus on the earth, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. I just read to you what John the Baptist said. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's not here. It's here. Here. Now watch. That's two. That's uh, John the Baptist. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Romans 4, 17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, you say, looking better. Matthew 10, looking shorter all the time. Matthew 10, here's Jesus. He sends his disciples out. The 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. See if this sounds familiar. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Start with the Jews. You say, why? They needed it the most. Who, who, by the way, who crucified Jesus? Jew or Gentile? Both. Both, but actually the Jews led the charge. As you go, this is Matthew chapter 10, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. It tells me it came back then. Just that would cover it for me. I said, so watch. So you, 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 you got Daniel over here, the prophet. And he's talking about what I'm talking about and what Matthew is talking about. Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 
You said what? The whole time. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is near. Well, let's see. Who, who is ruling the earth at the time? Medo and Persians. That's who was running the, ruling the roost. That's in Daniel chapter 1, right? Just get started. Over here in Daniel chapter, uh, let's see right here. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Oh, yeah. Nebuchadnezzar, he's running the ruling the roost. One of them king types. Mean old dude. Watch. He sees this dream, doesn't understand it. And so the, they've got Daniel... It's got some of God's people in prison, so they get a hold of them, and he, they explain. Uh, let's see right here. Who was it? Let's see right here. Uh, Daniel went to Ariok, whom the Lord, the king, had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to them, Don't execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king. I'll interpret his dream for him. So Daniel said, Can they, can they do it? He said, They can do it. So he has this dream and four different in uh, starting in chapter 32, the head of the statue, he dreamed, he saw this statue. He said, what in the world is going on? It was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms coming down on it was made of silver. Its belly and thighs is made out of bronze. The big money's at the top. <laughs> then it's getting a little cheaper all the time. It's feet partly of iron, the foot feet part, and partly of baked clay, not very strong at all. Now watch. This was the dream, and now you interpret it. We will turn, interpret it to you, king. You, the king, are the king of kings, Nebuchadnezzar. They look, you look him up. You find him on the internet. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed mankind and the beast of the field, the birds of the air. You are the big dog on planet earth. Wherever they live, remember, you say, what's the time frame? 600. 600 B.C. 600 years before Jesus showed up. This went down. They went out there and they looked and they gave the king some information. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. You're the big dog. After you, I'm reading from Daniel 2.39, another kingdom will rise. You can go, you don't have to go any further than this college professor. He's seated right here in the room. So you got the, let's see, we got uh, the Babylonians and then the Medes and the Persians, Iran. You say they ruled the world for about a hundred and something years. They did. You could check that up. Check with the professor here. He gave me all the empires that there ever was that he could find. And we looked at them. Well, this, we're in about the middle here, right in here. And you start reading about this this what Daniel saw, and you're like, whoa. After you, another, the Medo-Persians will come, will write, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, that's the Greeks, Alexander the Great, you got him in history. There's the professor, argue with him. He'll, he'll, he'll sit down with you and say, no, it, 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 this was this one and that one, and that, it, he ain't lying. You say the Babylonians came, and then these Medo-Persians, then the Greeks came, Alexander the Great, then they looked up and there's the Romans. You say, these things have a way of following themselves. Well, that's the next big kingdom. Let's see, Rome, the Romans, strong as iron. It's pretty stout. For iron breaks and smashes everything. And that's what they did. I mean, they went, they, they ruled the world for several hundred years. The professor will tell you the exact details. Uh, break thing to pieces, just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Remember all them groups that the Romans just couldn't quite get going? I mean, they call them this and that and the other, make movies about them. That was a tough bunch. 
and they, they couldn't do any. What, what, what group was it, Professor, that ruled the, that are out there and given the Romans so much trouble because they had to scatter out to protect the Roman Empire? And it was just a big, they had the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay. So this kingdom that was there by when the Romans were out, you know, on the other side of the wall. So these kingdoms will be partly strong and partly brittle. The, 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 the coming down of, the, of the, uh, these Romans, you say, they just couldn't control all these different factions. And these, they got names for them. I've forgotten all of them. But I mean, it was, they were killers. I mean, they, you, they couldn't get them lined out. And that was the clay that on the, where their feet were. So the people will be a mixture and will not remain united. That's what happened to the Roman Empire. Any more than iron mixes with clay. Daniel has given you a look-see that he saw in a dream. In the time of those kings, when the Romans were there, done cost, we done got come out of the, the, uh, the first one, the Medes and the Persians, then it was the Greeks, and then it was Alexander the Great, and then the, then the Roman, and we're getting to the end of it. In the time of those kings, now listen carefully, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom in the time of those kings, well, which ones? The last ones, the Roman one. You say, Jesus showed up, the Romans rule the world. Yeah. He, and, and, and look, and the religious people of the earth, you say, who killed Jesus? Who killed him? Look, here's Matthew again. Here's Matthew again. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You're like, all these factions repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Chapter 10, they were sent out with specific instructions. He called his 12 disciples, gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. Their names were Simon and Peter, Brother Andrew, James, and Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, the one that wrote this. Do not go, do not go beyond among the Gentiles or any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. The kingdom, you, as you go, you preach this message. The kingdom of heaven, the one Jesus came to establish, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. They could raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy. They had a lot of authority. Jesus gave it to them. And they're roaming around in the Roman Empire. And guess who got together and said, we need to get rid of Jesus Christ. We need to get rid of him. We need to kill him and get him out of here. Guess who it was? The Jews. His own people. He like, his own people slaughtered him on a cross. And he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the lie. Through me, everything was made. You want to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Why say the same thing four different times? Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead. Why do it four times? Matthew had a, that's what they did. Mark, that's what they did. Luke, that's what they did. And John, why repeat something four times? So none of us could miss it. I mean, I gave you Daniel. In the time Daniel 2, listen to this carefully, 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be, that's going to be in the future, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms. The Roman Empire, I mean, was number one. And the kingdom of God was established there. It'll crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. He's talking about beyond the Romans' kingdom. 
He's talking about the kingdom of God here. It will itself endure. How long? Forever. You say. So if you're wondering about, I wonder what he's kind of, they got kind of a little group of people that's on the side. And they got some guy, got a few whiskers. And he's pointing them to Jesus. How to be saved. When you're baptized, look, you're baptized into his death. Buried with him, you die to sin. You're buried. You're being born again of water and the Spirit. You come out and you're raised from the dead through your faith in the resurrection of Jesus. It's when you go to a pool of water. Look. Watch. Before I do though, Daniel chapter 2. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. That's the kingdom of God that came with Jesus when he come in there. You say, was it established until he died and was buried and raised from the dead? Nope. It was near. Near. But not here yet. No. Nope. It's not there yet. But it's getting there. I'm reading Daniel 2. The great God. This is Daniel 2. Never forget this verse, by the way. This is about verse 45. The great God has shown the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. 4,000 and the 400 getting ready for this. Jesus came, the Romans ruled the Roman Empire, and when the smoke had clear, the kingdom of God was there, and it happened just like Daniel said. Well, now, after this kingdom had been established, you say, so you're a member of the kingdom of God. Yep. You say, so what's, uh, what's, your, what's your role? I speak the gospel. I never get off this. My job is to show you what it means when you say God became flesh, died on a cross, buried in a tomb, raised from the dead, stayed 40 days, showed him he was alive. Your sins have been removed and you're guaranteed to be resurrected from the dead. A win-win situation. You say, how much is this costing me? Do I look like somebody would take your money? I don't want your money. This is not about money. This is about eternity. So I got this little group over here. I was appointed to do this. We've been doing it for years. That podcast y'all see, that's a couple of my trained. There's Al, my oldest son. There's Jace, the son, the next son. Willie he goes all over the United States of America and other parts of the earth preaching that right there. So does Jephthah. They got that TV show looking for treasure, you know. But they're all, I'm listening to them. They're my sons. I trained them. You say, are they good boys? <clears throat> Are they good boys? Yeah. Have they ever sinned? Yeah. We all have. Or am I the only person who's sinned, me and my kids? No. We've all made mistakes. You just get up and get the dust off of you and let's go. So, you fast forward. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. You got them all, Hosea, he, they get out here. Malachi. Malachi, the last thing God had to say and then was silent.
for 400 years. I showed you what, what, what the world looked like 600 years before Jesus. 600 years. Let's see, Daniel, 607 years before Jesus, before Christ. One of the things was that dream. I showed you the dream. All the, the apostles and the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell the same story. The same story begins in like Matthew 16. And it's the same thing over and over. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, the hands of the elders, the chief priests. The most religious people on the earth are the ones that are after him. They're the ones who killed him. You know how I know that? Well, at the end of Matthew, we've come from Daniel and now we're in Matthew. Matthew, the last thing Matthew 28 says. You say, what does he say? You see what I've got written on the board? Let's see. The crucifixion. That's uh, Matthew chapter 27. The crucifixion. See that cross? Uh, the death of Jesus. On the cross. Put him in a tomb. The burial of Jesus. This is Matthew. The burial of Jesus. Uh-oh. The resurrection. Air coming out of that. See that air coming out of that? There, in the middle, that's where they put him. Raised from the dead. The resurrection. Now we have him speaking now. You say, what did he say then? He comes from the grave. Everybody looks up and says, good night. Even his disciples said, it can't be. They beat him to a pulp and strung him up. How in the world? They said, he said he was going to do it. Remember? He said he was going to do it. From that time on, the Bible says, his disciples were like, what in the world? Well, watch. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's Jesus was talking, the one who did this. Therefore, we're going to make disciples of all nations. That's what I'm doing right here. I'm fixing to baptize somebody because you asked me to. Some of you were baptized when you were about 10 or 12 years old. It didn't take, kind of like I did. I was baptized, but trust me when I tell you, the last thing you would say, there's a son of God. That came after I was 28 years old. I had time to look at all of who I, what I was, low down, whore, monger, smoking dope, drinking, drunk, you know, I want to be a joint. Don't ever do that. Therefore, here's Jesus talking, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, give me a break. Go make disciples and by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who said that? That'd be Jesus. I'm reading from Matthew 28, verse 18. Out of, out of these 25,000 groups, there's people that are still tell you, oh, well, you don't have to do that. I'm like, what? Jesus said, go make disciples, baptizing them in the Father, near the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You say, so you're going to baptize some in a minute? Yeah. I'm going to be just what he said. I'm going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to teach them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. You say, why do people come here to be baptized? Because a lot of them from where they're from, the dudes won't do it. They won't baptize them. They're like, I oh, don't need to do that. You're like, don't need to do it. You go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That was one of the verses in Mark. And then you get to finally, look, I'm just going to go. We just start through the Bible. Well, we get to book, the book of Acts. How long did it take them? The book of Acts. Guess what they preach? Peter gets up. This man was handed over to you by God's purpose and foreknowledge. Jesus. You, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Jesus the death of him. But God has raised him from the dead. That's what I'm saying 2,000 and some years later. I'm saying to you what Peter said to them. 
I mean, it ain't rocket science. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because, listen, it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. What Peter's trying to tell him, if it's impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus, it's impossible for death to keep its hold on you. Because as he preaches to him, what's this? You would think everybody would do this. No. Let's see. He's talking about Daniel. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I'm in Acts chapter. They said it's over. Chapter two. Look, the people heard this. They, they were what I've just got through saying. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the apostles, what shall we do? Here's a group of individuals that don't know what to do about this Jesus. Let's see. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Go across America. Guess what a lot of them would say? You don't have to do that. I'm like, what? Jesus, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for crying out loud. The promise is for you ever since Daniel and your children and for all who far off for whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, Peter's doing this. He warned them, Peter did. He pleaded with them, Peter did. He was doing God's work. He deserted Jesus and said, I don't know him. Jesus brought him back in and said, what about now? You saw me die. What about me? So Peter's reply was, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message, I'm in Acts chapter 1, verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. There's your kingdom of God. They waited all the way to Jesus died. Was very, the king has proven by his death, burial, resurrection that he is indestructible. If he's indestructible, which he is, he proved it. So are you who follow him. So you talk about baptism. We bury that old man this morning or woman and we bury him deep and we raise him up right over here. No alligators are in this pool of water. We're inside a building. Warm water. It's like a bathtub. Down there you go to my house and to be baptized. Cotton mouths, alligators, every man for himself. Well, there you go, Dad. <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, I want to talk about that a little bit more uh, in our overtime segment, uh, as well as some of the life changes uh, that we've seen as a result of that message. So if you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed. Uh, join us in our overtime to talk a little bit more uh, about what it is to live unashamed. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.